Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for another night of Ghost Education 101. We are excited and happy to have everybody here with us tonight. And we have a special guest with us, Chris McKinnell. He is the co-founder of the Warren, Founda Warren Legacy Foundation for Paranormal Research. He co-founded it with his grandmother, Lorraine Warren. And we are so excited to have you here to talk about ethics and the responsibilities of paranormal investigators. And we know they're going to be asking about some cases that you went on with your grandparents. So be prepared for that too. So Chris, do a quick introduction and explain a little bit more about yourself to everybody. Well, thank you everyone for having me on. And Heather, it's always a pleasure to be with you. Um, for those of you who don't know, Heather is actually one of the directors of the Warren Legacy Foundation, and she's extraordinary. Um, I mean, you get to see that on her show, so you already know. Um, but the Warren Legacy Foundation for Paranormal Research is a worldwide organization that helps people um, with their paranormal problems. If you think that you have a problem with the paranormal, then we're here to help you. And we do it all for free. We don't uh, publicize our cases ever. Uh, that's really important to us uh, because I've seen firsthand what publicity can do to a family. And I never want to see that again. Sorry, I put myself on mute there for a minute. But if you guys do need help, I know I was going to save this for later on, but we do have the email down there, help at warrenlegacy.com. You guys can email that and we're ready to help you with anything you need. And so basically, I want to talk to you about ethics today. That's been a big problem in the paranormal field. And personally, I think it has to do with a lot of the TV shows out there. So I yes. just kind of wanted to get your opinion on ethics in the community right now and how to be an ethical investigator. You know, one of the reasons uh, that the foundation actually exists is because of this Wild West attitude and because of the overwhelming egos in the field. Uh, I've seen firsthand again uh, what these ego egotists can do to a family. You know, they go in, they stir up trouble, they get their five minutes of video and their thousands of hits online, and then they leave the family in trouble. That, to me, is reprehensible. And none of the members of the foundation would ever do that. Uh, we've had a couple who got in, and then we discovered later that, yeah, they also engage in that kind of stuff. But they don't last long. Um, later, if you like, I'll tell you a horror story about one of them. <laughs> I'm sure we'll get to that. And I'm just looking over the code of ethics for the foundation. And the first bullet point is to that the foundation doesn't promote paranormal tourism. Can you yeah. kind of explain that to people who might not know what paranormal tourism is and why mm -hmm. we don't promote it? You know, a lot of people want to go into these uh, asylums and prisons and other places that are dangerous, uh, whether they're physically dangerous because they've been abandoned and they're not kept up or because there are spirit, spirits in there that can attach to you and bring you can bring something home with you. Uh, that's it's just irresponsible. And I, I don't want to see anybody get hurt. You know. If you're going to go into a place and bring people with you, then you should make sure that you're going to a place you know is safe. Now, if you know it's safe, then I don't really have a problem with it. Um, we had a case that was brought to us by a team in uh, Germany. And they had not, they were new. They had not done their due diligence and they had taken a group into this former Nazi girls school that had then been used to um, uh, store V2 rockets. And it had also been used uh, for satanic rituals. And they had taken the public into the basement where these rituals had been performed, where there were still sigils and all sorts of things up on the walls. And there was this entity there that came across like a little girl and it reached out to a, a, one of the guests who happened to be psychic. And the woman was about to take her hand and this entity had this ghastly grin on its face. 
And so she pulled back quickly. But a few days later, the girl showed up at her door barefoot in the snow, knocking on the doors and saying, um, have you seen my have you seen Herman? And when she and her son said, who's Herman? They said, it's my dog. No, there's no Herman here. And she closed the door on the girl. And the boys begged her, her mother, their mother, to let this girl in because it was snowing and the, the child was barefoot and only on a, a sweater. And when she opened the door, the girl was gone and there were no footprints. But the damage was done. She had opened the door to allow the child in. And for the next two years, this entity would show up on their cases before they would go there. Um, it had attacked this woman's uh, husband, pushed him down the stairs. Another um, member of, and, and by the way, this woman had actually joined this team after that. Um, another woman, her um, daughter, was pulled out of bed and then astrally pulled out of her body and taken into this horror nightmare landscape and terrorized. Um, a number of other things happened and they had come to me looking for help and we did help them. But unfortunately, an awful lot of our cases are people who call themselves investigators, but what they are, are hobbyists. Um, if you treat this as a hobby and not as a profession, you're going to get hurt. Mm -hmm. Right. And is that, sorry, I was reading the comments that were popping up to see if there are any questions coming up. And was that the case that you were talking to me about a while ago that you sent me photos for? Uh, the Nazi demon? Yes. Yeah. Is it okay yeah. to share the photos? Oh, yeah. If you've got it handy, okay. go right ahead. I do have that. Yeah, now this, this uh, photo was taken from a video, and it was actually taken in um, a, what they thought was a druid circle that they had visited. And they thought that they had been visited by the green man, an elemental, who had then uh, told them to go to this school because it was a terrible place and they needed to work in it. Uh, but in my opinion, it was this entity that you see right here. Now you can see the, the tree lit up really well. And then off to the uh, right, there's a skeletal figure standing there. It almost looks like the, the ghost from um, the Ring movies, Ringo. There you go. Oops. Ah, I lost it. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry, I started sharing the wrong thing. Started sharing our... I lost the photo. <laughs> Well, there are three photos there. It's not a problem. But yeah. <laughs> but yeah, the, the TV Technology. shows, um, unfortunately, promote really bad practices um, like, like Ghost Adventures. You know, honestly, I don't know any of these paranormal celebrities other than Zach Baggins. He's the one name I know. Um, and I've watched his program twice. One time he had some person who called themselves a demonologist on and the demonologist and a, a group of supposed mediums had gotten in a circle and then were inviting the spirits that they considered demonic um, to enter them to communicate. Now, if you did that in reality, you could really be hurt. Mm -hmm. So... You know, I mean, for instance, Arnie Johnson from Conjuring 3, in reality, he did invite a spirit into him. And he came under possession and somebody ended up dead. Mm -hmm. So it's not something to play around with. But mm -hmm. I, I honestly don't think Zach Baggins believes in the paranormal. I think that uh, he is a wonderful showman. Um, he's a very successful performer. Um, but I wouldn't ever take anything he says seriously. And one question that was brought up while you we were talking about the children is um, maybe black eyed children aren't so much an urban legend. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I talk about this a lot. Uh, <laughs> the paranormal is shaped by our cultural beliefs, our religious beliefs, and it is different all around the world. 
Um, the Black Eyed Children started becoming popular in the 90s and really took off in Britain and, were, and showed up an awful lot there. Um, they're not as popular anymore. They don't show up as often anymore. Um, and you will see this throughout uh, history. Uh, you know, I mean, for instance, the things that we call elementals, the, these nature spirits, um, why do they come across differently all over the world? And here in Costa Rica, where I am, we've, we've got duendes, which are a type of elf um, or gnome, house gnome. And we've got um, the La Mona, which is a, a little two to three foot tall monkey-like creature that they believe is a witch that can turn into this creature. Now, this actually does appear throughout Latin America in different forms. Um, and all around the world, there are stories of witches being able to turn themselves into uh, other creatures. Now, you study magic. Is that something you can do? I Maybe if I tried hard enough. <laughs> it's not something I want to do or I try to do, but you never know. <laughs> I think the thing I'm trying to get across, though, is um, I believe that most, most of the things that we see that are not ghosts are created through self-manifestation, through our own fears and through what we don't understand. That's why shadow people are so popular right now um, and they manifest more often than anything else because our, our fears are, are formless. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if a shadow person isn't an actual ghost and in my opinion, they almost always are, um, then it's a nameless fear that's manifesting. Right. Um, the same thing with the, 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 the hat, the, the man with the hat, uh, the mm -hmm. black figure with the hat and so forth. Hat man. <laughs> yeah. Hat man. Uh, hat man. <laughs> uh, but these are these are things that we we can do and i think the thing to take away from this is look at the power we have and if we can learn how to harness it instead of it being wild and uncontrolled imagine what we could do with the world right yeah and that's similar to the stories of the rake which is that creature in the forest the rake. that yeah that just that's, appears uh, britain? is that britain i think so I think that's where it's been most commonly reported, but there have been yeah. reports, I think, in the U.S., only probably because people have researched it mm -hmm. and, like you said, yeah. manifested it out here now, too. Yeah. Well, it's like the Slender Man. You know, mm -hmm. we know for a fact that that was an invention of the Internet back in around 1991, and yep. yet now it has actually shown up on cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. And I know you and I, you and I have talked a lot about this working on some projects that we're doing and it's a very interesting concept and i've definitely learned a lot <laughs> regarding that well and yeah here, here's a shameless pitch for you uh heather and i are writing a book <laughs> together so uh it'll be out eventually yeah i think it's going to end up being more than one <laughs> i mean yeah well that's because your, your co-author is long-winded <laughs> uh, so carolyn wants to know if just opening the door can let an entity in and giving it uh, the right to stay Yes. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's your intention. If your intention is to make contact with the spirit, then absolutely that opens the door. Now, having said that, if you mean a physical door, uh, remember that the woman had opened the door and then closed it, then that didn't make an attachment. It was when her intention was to let the spirit in, mm -hmm. in my opinion. That's when the attachment was made. No. Then Robbie wants to know um, the place in Scotland that affected you the most. I suppose I should put my glasses on. <laughs> so he wanted to know what place in Scotland has affected you. In Scotland? Um, I, can't, I can't really pick anything out in particular. And then Robin wants to know the difference between paranormal investigation versus paranormal tourism. One of the rules of the um, of the foundation is if you're not there to help, then you shouldn't be there at all. And tourism isn't about helping. Okay, and 
then the next question is, can an entity at, um, be attracted if you show fear? And I think you discussed that a little bit. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. If, if you're afraid, then what you're manifesting is going to make you more afraid. Um, my grandmother said that um, when what you put out is what you get back. If you put out positive energy, you get back positive energy. If you put out negative energy, that's what you attract. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then there's another question here that says, um, it's from Emma. She said that her mom had asked, how can a Christian get possessed? Anybody can be. It's incredibly rare, but it's all about you. And it's about what you allow, what you open the door to. Um, if, unfortunately, if you happen to be one of those people who has... Um, an underlying vulnerability, then they can take advantage of that and they can hurt you. Okay. I lost my train of thought. So while I find where the questions went, because I completely scrolled down. Um, I have been to Edinburgh uh, Castle, Johnny. Uh, really loved it, actually. Um, but it was many, 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 many years ago with my grandparents. Um, back in, good Lord, I would have to say probably 1987. Okay, yeah, and he said, he responded later on saying that for him it was the Culloden Moor. Oh, okay. So, I've um, never been to Scotland, so I have well, no idea. <laughs> yeah. And I have been to Grey Far Friars Bobby, but not recently. I, I understand that... Uh, there's a lot of activity going on there now, um, but I, I haven't witnessed any myself. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then real quick, before I get back to some of the questions, in our code of ethics, we talk about, um, well, do no harm. I completely lost where I was going to go with this. Oh, the difference between helping spirits as well as we're there to help our clients and the spirits as well. Absolutely. So and I, I believe if, that? If, if we can help the spirits, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, but our primary focus needs to be on the family that brings us in or, or the individual that brings us in and helping the living. Um, the problem with being a ghost is they still have free will. And mm -hmm. if they don't want to leave, they, they don't have to leave. If they want to stay in denial, as to what's happened to them, they, they can stay in denial. Uh, often um, helping them to pass over is a, is a counseling session. It isn't a, uh, it's not a confrontation usually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that, you know, that's why we call us, para that's why they call us parapsychologists. I can't even talk tonight. I need to go to bed. <laughs> uh. Knowing that demons don't play fair, how does one protect themselves from an un unwittingly letting in an entity? Don't try to communicate with spirits. Don't be d doing EVPs and seances and Ouija boards and all of these other things that people do. Uh, because it's a very slippery slope. If you don't know what you're doing exactly, uh, you can unwitt unwittingly say the wrong thing and invite something in. Yeah, because I think there was one case we worked on that all the mom did was tell the spirits to go away. And even though she was saying go away, she was afraid and she opened up the door essentially to them communicating even more. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if, if you're going to demand that a spirit leave, um, it's always by the power of however you view God. Uh, by the power of God, by the power of Jesus, by the power of Allah, I command you to be gone. Mm -hmm. uh, you are not welcome in this home. When we do a house cleansing, we go through, first, uh, we light a candle to symbolize God's presence in the home. Uh, then we use whatever type of incense we happen to be using, uh, whether it be uh, sage, frankincense, and myrrh. Uh, Dragon's Blood, uh, Palo Santo, which I don't really recommend because it is rare. Um, and we go through each room. We smudge at the same time, commanding by the power of God that 
we seal the home, that we expel all spirits. They have no invitation to stay, that um, any invitation they may feel that they have had is rescinded. Uh, and then we use either holy, blessed, we use blessed oil or uh, holy water, and we make a uh, mark cross, if you're a Christian, over every window and door. And that seals that room. And then you go through and you do every single room in the house until you get to the very end. Now, I, me, if it's a freestanding home, I then take less salt and I circle the home to seal the home completely. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what are your thoughts? I mean, this is just something I thought of because when I do the home cleansings for clients, I also mm -hmm. use cascaria. Okay. I and we use cascaria. Oh, yeah, we use it to do the cross over the door or whatever symbol their religion believes in. And then we have the actual homeowner or the person being affected seal it with the holy water or blessed oil over the door. Frame. Very good. Yeah. Uh, the thing that's important is people need to understand that ritual focuses your intention. And if you have the faith to back it up, then any ritual works. The ritual is only there to focus your faith and your intentions. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then there was a question texted to me that said, because um, we had this in a recent interview that we did with a client, um, what are, how do you handle everyone wanting to blame the paranormal for little things? I think people need to remember that real life can be difficult and that we should always rule out the reasonable and the normal before we look at the paranormal. Um, unfortunately, yeah, we, we see that a lot. We see people who say, oh, well, now I'm sick all the time. People do get sick, you know, um, and that, that's a reality. It doesn't have to be a curse. Um, you see your doctor first, you know, mm -hmm. and if I, I would suggest, I, I would suggest, honestly, um, and this is backed by a scientific study. Uh, if, if somebody you love or yourself is uh, very ill, put them on as many prayer lists as you can on the Internet everywhere. Uh, because when you have that many people praying for you, it really does make a difference. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I guess that brings me to the next question I have for you. Um, what are your thoughts on why everyone blames it on a demon? It's sexy. Uh, I almost, it's almost never a demon. Right. <laughs> you know, and even then, you know, what is a demon exactly? Mm -hmm. Because if you look at the history of demons, or if you look at the way they manifest all around the world, it's completely different from culture to culture. And mm -hmm. I don't know exactly what they are, but I, I, I really don't think they're Christian. I don't mm -hmm. think they're fallen angels. Um, and historically they weren't. Um, it's only in the last 2000 years that that started to change. But if you go back to Greek and Roman times, Demons were the uh, intermediaries between the gods and humans. And even today in, in Hindu uh, culture, you've got Garuda, who is a messenger of the gods. He's a demon. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And it's I because that's I guess the next question we should answer is um, how because we do have a lot of um, new investigators that watch us. How do you handle when a client calls you and says they're being tormented by a demon and that's the client's dead set on it being a demon? Let us look into it first. Mm -hmm. Let us check it out. Let's not jump to any conclusions. Um, in reality, it's almost never a demon. I, th I find that education is the, the strongest thing you can use with a family. Um, mm -hmm. Lessening their fear also lessens the, the power of the entity. Uh, people are afraid of the unknown. People are uh, afraid of the tap at the door mm -hmm. and uh, the footsteps in the middle of the night uh, or the shadow standing in your, in your, uh, over your bed at night. 
Mm-hmm. And I understand that. I get, so of course that can be scary if you don't know what you're dealing with. But nine times out of 10, it's your grandmother come to visit. You know, it's, it's not a demon. Mm-hmm. And we, we don't want you to feed it all of this negative energy because then it starts to manifest that way. Right. And, and the one story that I always tell people to um, how not to let fear affect them and how it worked for me one time is we did an investigation and I don't know if the spirit so much followed me home, but in the middle of the night, I was woken up, our TV had been on, and I could clearly see the outline of like a six foot six tall man, which was the same spirit that mm-hmm. I saw at the location we were investigating. And you could see the TV glowing around him. And he you know, basically told me, don't ever come back to this location again, you'll be in danger. Whether it was a warning mm-hmm. or a threat, I wasn't too sure. And I just rolled over and went back to sleep. Yeah. It was like I pretended he was not there, rolled over and went back to sleep, and he's never bothered me since. <laughs> yeah, I actually so. had a similar experience uh, twice here in Costa Rica after we visited uh, this sanitarium. Uh, something came to the house where I was, my first apartment, turned on the TV in the middle of the night. I was like, huh. Oh. Got up, turned off the TV, went back to sleep. <laughs> You know, and then the night before I left, uh, first the T, I, I had already unplugged the television. I had pulled off my Amazon Fire Stick, and uh, the TV turned on by itself. Kept playing the same video over and over and over again, every, a thirty-second clip, while I'm brushing my teeth. Then the garbage uh, in the uh, kitchen falls over by itself. I'm like. You just leave me alone. I'm tired. <laughs> I just, I, I'm not going to let these things intimidate me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're, they're essentially toddlers wanting attention. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and if you don't give them the attention, then eventually they go find something else to occupy their time. <laughs> okay. So another question brought up by Philip who is not on with me tonight, but hopefully he's on with me next time we're live. Um, But can black eyed children be topas at this point, such as like the thin man? Yes. Uh, A tulpa or um, an egregore is another name that we use. Um, That's exactly what I think these things are. They're, they're a self manifested uh, horror story for uh, there's the, the story of the, um, the phantom hitchhiker. That was very popular in the 50s, 60s, 70s. This girl would get picked up and driven to either a uh, an abandoned building or would just disappear in the back seat of the car. Um, and it was reported for decades. But now, because nobody ever hitchhikes, we never hear about these uh, fandom hitchhikers anymore. Yeah, it's probably because no one stops to pick them up either. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, picking up a, a pretty girl that, that's looking for a ride on the side of the road, there are a lot of people that will. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And Ryan, thank you for watching tonight. If things can form out of fear, then can't we manifest things out of protection and love? Absolutely. Absolutely. Sure. And, and we should. Uh, that's why when we talk about psychic protection, uh, like for instance, the, the Christ light or the different bubble techniques that we use to, to surround ourselves. Um, those are manifestations of our own uh, faith and our own power surrounding us and calling on something positive, however you view God, to surround you and protect you. Mm-hmm. But without your faith, without your belief, it will not work. And then I know you mentioned Sage was one of the things, but does Sage help with ridding the house of spirits? And do you have any insight as to why, I guess, would be another question to add to that. Uh, It does, but only for about two and a half to three hours. Uh, That's why the ritual is so important. Um, It will, and we know this, we we know this actually um, scientifically as well. It does uh, lift energy in a home. I believe that's why it's effective, as a matter of fact. Um, I use copal, which is a a Mexican incense that's very powerful as well. Um, I've used that on many occasions. 
Matter of fact, I was in a home, uh, was it Friday? Friday. And uh, actually three homes. And it was the second one that I almost got knocked over from the, the negative energy in the home. And we used the Copal and cleaned out what was there. But I'm afraid that there was some black magic being used against the homeowner. So I'm sure that we'll have to go back and work on that. Until she leaves, mm -hmm. because she's living with a magic user who hates her. And then Johnny wants to know what the name of the book is. I don't think we came up with a title for it yet, have we? <laughs> no, not yet. No. <laughs> yeah. Um, just from the notes that I've been doing with, I've been interviewing Chris a lot, getting information. Basically, it's just um, a book on almost Paranormal 101. We're going to talk about different parts of the paranormal and then explain through cases that he's done, how it works and a whole bunch of other stuff. So stay tuned for that. And then after that, I know we have that book that we're doing with all of our regional directors and foundation members where we all share a case in the book and we're compiling a book of cases that we've been on before. So keep your eyes open. Yeah. You can definitely and follow us. And we also us. want to teach people how to protect themselves. So we'll definitely yeah. have a, a shorter book on different protection techniques and different cultural, uh, culturally specific techniques, yep. um, as well as psychic protection. Um, right. You know, even simple things like psychic grounding, which really, for anybody who suffers from anxiety or panic attacks, uh, empaths who get overwhelmed by the energy they picked up during the day, uh, going outside in your bare feet and using visualization, first a breathing technique to relax and calm yourself and center yourself, and then visualizing uh, either a lightning rod or a white cord going straight down from the top of your head, straight down through your body and buried deep into the earth. And then imagining all of that negative energy flowing down that cord into the earth, ground out. And then feeling the ionic energy of the earth to fill you up again. That's a very, very powerful technique. It's, it's prescribed by psychologists. Um, we know that ionic energy transfer is a very real thing. It only works bare feet on, on actual earth. So you don't want to do it on concrete or with shoes on. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then that brings me up to a topic... That, oh, um, wait, I see one I want to answer. Okay. Any advice for paranormal okay. hobbyists? Yes, don't be yep. one. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I was scrolling through the comments because my comments went all the way to the bottom, and then I just scroll back to the top to catch up with some of the ones that we've missed. But talking about... Um, me, a paranormal hobbyist, it's like saying, you know, I really like the idea of surgery. Um, it, it, you have any uh, advice for me on how to do surgery? Don't. <laughs> You know, go to college, learn how to be a surgeon. You don't pick up a scalpel and uh, take out a monkey brain, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah. And since we were talking about the book and um, Paranormal 101 and protection against the paranormal, um, I want to let everybody know, make sure you keep an eye out on our page because we will be sharing information soon. Hopefully before the end of the year, we're going to be launching some online classes you can take including um, from paranormal protection, basic investigative techniques. And um, also I think we're doing a class on our ethics so people can understand more about the ethics that we follow as a foundation. So keep an eye yeah. out for that. And, you know, to me, it's basically my goal and I'm older, so my, I can't do this forever, obviously. Um, my, my goal is to get this code of ethics adopted by all researchers around the world. And if a family is in trouble, I want them to say, do you follow the Warren code of ethics? I want it to be something famous like the Hippocratic Oath. And if I can only accomplish that much in my life, then I, I feel like I've done, I'm the most successful guy in the world because mm -hmm. I don't want the crazies going in and stirring things up, making it so much worse for a family. Um, by the way, if you're in trouble, please don't go to a television show for help. All they care about is ratings. They don't care about you. Yeah. 
Okay, and then Craig wants to know what your thoughts are on the Winchester Mansion, land or building. Oh, that's fascinating to me. Uh, <laughs> I've never gotten to visit it yet. I really would like to. Um, I haven't studied it that much, but I, I do know that the woman who created it, that uh, she had to keep building because it was supposed to keep the ghosts of all the people who were killed by Winchesters at, at bay. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of heartbreaking, the, the pain and guilt that she felt. Now, is that self-manifestation? Was she was, was it her own guilt and fear that were manifesting these spirits or not? I, I, I don't know. Um, somebody had asked, uh, are there any good ghosts? Absolutely, there are good ghosts. There are more good ghosts than bad. I mean, just like there are more good people in the world than there are bad people. Ghosts are just people. Um, mm -hmm. Often they're here because either they, they've got unfinished business or they're in denial or they're afraid. Um, and that's heartbreaking, you know, when, when it's fear holding them back from passing over or when it's um, mental illness. Uh, perhaps they died from a drug abuse or the delirious and they're just confused. They just need help. Mm -hmm. um, it can be scary for you because you don't know what you're dealing with and they're acting out out of fear themselves. Uh, but they're not bad. They're just hurt and they need some help. Yeah. And okay. Oh, that's the other question. So you started relatively early in your life. Um, how young were you when you started working with your grandparents or investigating the paranormal? Uh, my very first case, I was 16 years old. I had been looking into it for years ahead of that, of course, because of my grandparents. But my very, very first case, I was 16 years old, and it was an over-the-top Hollywood blockbuster poltergeist case where just about everything, cliche, every cliche you can imagine happened. The upside-down crucifix, the two hulking black shapes coming down the stairs, the woman clawed in the middle of the, in, while we're on the phone on a radio program, um, a, a pot with Holy Church incense flying around the corner at my head, banging and pounding in the walls, growling and clawing in the walls, um, all of it on my very first case, lights going on and off, the chair I was, had just been sitting in, flipping and flying across the room. Uh, and yet, somehow, instead of uh, thinking, yeah, no, this ain't for me, I, I said, yeah, this is for me. <laughs> Maybe I'm an adrenaline junkie. I really have no idea. <laughs> You're a paranormal tourist and you don't know it. <laughs> Possibly. You know, honestly, <laughs> today, I can honestly say I don't like the paranormal. It does not any. It does not interest me any longer. Um, I, I've come to terms with the fact that I'm never going to have the all the answers I want in this lifetime. We just don't have all the theories, and we don't have the we don't have the tools to investigate mm -hmm. properly. Um, so the only reason I continue this is because there's a need to help. And we can fill that need. And for me, you know, the, I'm so blessed to have the people I have in the foundation working with us. They are amazing. And I, I love them. And I thank God every single day for them. Um, for you. You know, uh, you well, and I, I'm just glad I was given a chance to join you guys a year ago because this month, actually next month, I celebrate my one year anniversary. And it's been very interesting. <laughs> It seems like I've been a part of the foundation a lot longer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I can't imagine it without you. <laughs> okay, the next question, it took me a few minutes to translate, thanks to my handy dandy phone. <laughs> so basically what really protects people with spiritual attacks? Is it their faith or what they have their faith in? It's their faith, it's their faith. Um, in my experience, God doesn't care what what name you use for God. He doesn't care what path you're taking to God. As long as you're getting closer to God, 
that's all that matters. There's that great Hindu um, proverb or story. Uh, it, it's it's the how's it go? Um, God God is like a man on top of a mountain, and it's only the idiot running around the bottom of the mountain telling everybody they're going the wrong way that never gets any closer to God. Mm -hmm. um, if you think about it. Today, NASA, not today, recently, NASA said there are more living worlds in the universe than there are grains of sand on Earth. I think given that, the, the mind of God, the mind of the creator is beyond my comprehension. The, the God that keeps track of all of that life, all of, all of those things going on, how, how, how is my going to figure that out? That's where my faith comes in. It's accepting my my lack of perspective and my my absolute ignorance. Yeah. And actually, before I continue with some of the questions, before we, I mean, we're only 45 minutes into this, so we still have plenty of time. But we wanted to talk about the responsibilities of paranormal investigators. And I guess this would go along with the do no harm belief, almost like the Boy Scouts leave no trace behind, but do no harm in the paranormal field. Um, what do you feel the responsibilities of investigators are to their clients? Oh, there are a number of them. Uh, first, do no harm. Absolutely. Um, if you feel you're out of your depth, then you make sure you get them the right help. Uh, for instance, for us in the foundation, uh, if you come to us and we believe that the problem has psychological components not that there isn't something paranormal too but if it also has psychological components it's not our job to deal with the psychological issues it's our job to help you get that help uh to encourage you to go through your insurance company or whatever and and get a good psychologist and it's to maybe coach you on how to talk to your doctor if there might be, for instance, there was a woman uh, who had been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and she just could not believe that the tremor she was feeling and the, the, the thumping in her back was anything other than demonic. I said, have you been to your doctor recently? Not in years. Well, then how do you know it's not the multiple sclerosis you're dealing with? We need to check that out first. And she would send me videos and photos all the time of things she said were paranormal. But all I would see were pieces of dust floating in the air um, or nothing at all. Often just nothing at all was there. Um, and I, that's the other thing, you know, uh, real quick aside here. But digital photography takes small things and the light can make it seem like something else and much bigger. Um, there was a, a neat one where somebody had tagged me and said, look, it, it's a ghost. And I was like, no, it's a moth flying around a, a light. Um, you know, uh, somebody had asked me, had asked, uh, Shannon had asked about um, uh, uh, an investigation we were supposed to do before COVID hit and then COVID hit. Uh, and this was going to be um, something we were sharing with the public because it was a safe location and everything else. Unfortunately, it was canceled. Um, I do need the people that paid for their tickets to contact me so that I can repay them for that. I, I apologize. Um, I had hoped we could do something with that, but it, it we weren't able to. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I know a lot of events. I actually, with my former team, we had a bunch of events set up to go out in Vegas, and they all ended up falling through because of COVID. Yeah, I, I kept hoping we could reschedule, 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 and now um, the the people that were arranging that are no longer with the foundation anyway. So that that avenue is closed to us. So I do mm -hmm. want to return the money to those people who did pay. But those watching, don't worry, too, because we will have more events, hopefully, in the near future. <laughs> yeah. And for me, the, uh, it's more about education than anything else. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, we're, we're doing an event here in uh, Costa Rica. Um, 
And it actually is, God help us, in a sanatorium. Uh, but I've been there before. I know it's safe. Um, or I wouldn't be doing it. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, it. My team here has been encouraging me to do these things forever. And I just feel like as long as it's safe, I'm happy to help them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's get back to the questions for a little bit. Um, my sister-in-law is having things happen in her house. She's not afraid, but the activity is getting more frequent. Should she start being worried? Not necessarily. Uh, the first thing I would ask is, is the activity anything to be afraid of? If you're not being hurt, then no, why be afraid? You know, if it's walk, for instance, um, this is one of my favorite ghost stories, actually. Every night at 10 o'clock at night, um, the family would hear footsteps coming down the stairs and then the, the kitchen door, they would hear it open. They would hear the popcorn popping, even though they didn't own an air popper. That's what they would hear. Then they would hear the footsteps go back up the stairs. What's to be afraid of? There's nothing was hurting you. You know, you just happen to have, uh, somebody who's in the house with you. That's all. Right. And could that be something like residual energy, too, yeah. of someone yeah, who actually, do that every in night? Case, in this case, I would be, I believe it probably was just a residual haunting. And for those who don't know what that means, um, a residual haunting doesn't actually have a spirit involved. It's it's a an impression made by repetitive uh, energy in a home. Um, I was with my grandparents in England, in uh, Devon. And um, we were in a pub having lunch. And my grandmother looks outside the, the window, uh, the front window, and she sees a bunch of Roman soldiers marching by. But she can only see them from the shoulder up. And the rest was underground. And she mentioned it to the woman who owned the pub. And she said, oh, that makes sense. The, the Roman road is buried underneath the road that's there now. So she was seeing them walking on the ancient road. But no spirits were there. It was just a residual haunting. Yep. Yeah. And okay, so Craig wants to know he doesn't use religion at all. So how would any of this work? I I'm assuming that that means like any of the cleansings and right. Um, I'm not a religious man. I'm a very spiritual man. I absolutely believe in, believe in God. I am a minister, but I'm a, a minister without a religion. Um, Without faith, you're going in unarmed and unprotected. If you have vulnerabilities, in other words, PTSD, depression, panic, anxiety, uh, pre-existing conditions of some sort, then you could be open to something negative attaching to you. And you should be very, very careful. Now, most people use Ouija boards and never have an experience. It's the ones that have those underlying vulnerabilities that get hurt. And that's why we urge people not to do those things. It isn't that you will get hurt, but it's Russian roulette. Mm -hmm. Right. And that brings up a question that I'm going to ask you <laughs> because Ouija boards, I know completely against using it. Um, and pendulum boards, I'm assuming the same thing. But it isn't. Pendulums okay. are different. All right, because here's the thing about a Ouija board. A Ouija board really only has one purpose, to make contact with spirit. But a pendulum, you can ask questions, and you're not necessarily asking them of spirit. You're just asking questions. Okay. As long as you're not trying to make contact with a spirit, you know, um, Grandma, if you're here, move the pendulum this way or that way. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. It's that intention to make contact with spirit that's a problem. A good psychic, a good medium, when they communicate with a spirit, they communicate with the spirit that presents itself. They don't call on a spirit and invite, open a door for, for a particular spirit to come through because once you open the door, anything can come through. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. But and then around us all the time. Right. And then that brings me to part B of that question. What about EVP sessions? Same thing. It's a slippery slope from, I, you know, I think honestly, other than myself, pretty much everybody I know does EVP. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're going to do them, try at least do them passively. Um, Ken Torres, another one of our directors, when he does it, he turns on the recorder but he doesn't speak. He doesn't ask questions. Um, he just lets something come across if it will. Right. I think that's safer because mm -hmm. when you engage, you create an emotional attachment, which then creates a spiritual attachment. You right. can open the yeah. door. Because the one thing I've always done with EVP sessions and, you know, I've used the pendulum to communicate as well when there's no other way to communicate because if they're able to move it, if they're not able to talk, but I always close it at the end. I'm very polite throughout the whole thing. I don't, in, you know, antagonize or provoke them in any way. And I always make sure I thank them for their time and that I'm done communicating. You know, if they leave me alone, I may come back and try to talk to them again, but they need to know that it's the end of the session and we're done. Even then I'm, I'm worried. I, I admit that. I mean, mm -hmm. that's that's similar to, you know, when uh, people talk about the the Ouija board and closing the, the door when you're done. Well, you've already let it in. How do you know that you, you, you can kick it out again? Don't right. get me wrong. I, I do believe it is possible. It's just mm -hmm. for the layman, it, it's a dangerous thing. And it's something I don't want to model for them. Right. And that's one thing I always tell people. I mean, I don't tell people, you know, hey, go use a Ouija board, go use this. Or I, I don't even tell them to go do EVP sessions. I prefer people don't talk to them unless they're trained and know what they're doing and know how to handle it if it doesn't work getting them to stop. Because I think that's where the problems come in is the fear develops when they don't know, you know, OK, I let something in on accident. You know, now what do I do? And then it just, you know, snowballs from there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and, and it's that fear that's the, the real enemy. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, somebody, I, I, I caught a message here uh, or a question about if you know a team isn't good and they act like they are, et cetera. You know, I have um, in the past, for instance, there was a guy who sells these spirit boxes for two to four thousand dollars each um and what he does he takes a clip an audio clip of a famous person and then he'll alter it a little bit or he'll play it backwards or whatever uh so you hear that voice and you recognize it and he did that with my grandparents after they died and he he's a fake he, he's a complete and absolute fake um, but when I tried to expose him, the truth is the backlash from all of his followers was, mm. you know, you, you can't convince people who don't want to be convinced. If you know a team is out there and they're bad, sure, speak up, but be prepared because very few people want to actually hear that. Mm. Um, best to warn a family if you know that that team is going to visit somebody um I, I i've seen far too many bad teams out there mm -hmm. yeah unfortunately it happens and they just they need more education too to make themselves better <laughs> if if their purpose is to actually help yeah absolutely mm -hmm. we're and that's one of our goals you know we've got mm -hmm. four goals in the foundation one of them is to educate the next generation of researchers but there are too many out there that just want the, the clicks and the and the and the subscriptions and everything else. They're they're in it for the money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So the one question I have here um, is: Can spirits follow you when you move to another home? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a spiritual attachment. If if their house is haunted, no problem. But if they're attached to you, then yeah, they're going to follow you. Now, having said that. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, many people will tell me, oh, no matter where I go, I'm always followed by the spirits. And I was like, well, 
no, the truth is you're psychic and your aura burns more brightly than an ordinary person's. And so you're like a lighthouse in the darkness for spirits. And so you attract them no matter where you go. So that's a, that's a, a different uh, problem that you have to deal with. And mm -hmm. that's, again, one of, another one of the goals of the foundation is working with psychics and helping them with their abilities and helping them to understand them so that they're able to manage them better. Yeah. Yeah. I know a lot of people since I've joined have helped me a lot with some things I didn't understand. So it's, it's a good asset to have. Yeah. Well, and, and, and vice versa, believe me, mm -hmm. no one knows everything, especially right. in this field. I mean, nobody knows in this field. Mm -hmm. I am a student and um, for all of our talks and everything else, <laughs> I'm the first to admit the more I learn, the, the less I know, the more mm -hmm. questions I have. Um, and the things we talk about, and I act like I think I know, uh, I, I'm, I'll be the first to admit their theory. And mm -hmm. they're things that I probably wouldn't have thought five years ago. Hell, there are things I say today that I would not have thought a year ago because mm -hmm. I've gotten new data. Um, if you treat the paranormal, like this static monolith that you can learn about and that's it that's it you you know it there's no change then it's a religion it's not a field of study mm -hmm. yep and for me it's a field of study so i'll always be a student <laughs> okay kenneth wants to know what is the most common entity besides a humanoid that people believe people experience during hauntings those would be your elementals, uh, which, again, in my opinion, is probably um, a self-manifestation. There are some entities that come across and they have knowledge that, that no one else has. But those are few and far between. Now, when they happen, those are really interesting to me. Those are fascinating. But I've never seen a demon do anything as bad as what a human being could do to another human being, for instance. Um, and I've never seen the wisdom of the ages from these demons. Why do they repeat the same patterns of behavior again and again and again? You know, they're predator, you know, they're predators, but they're not really all that intelligent for the most part. Mm -hmm. There are a few, there are a few that can speak other languages and, um, manifest in that way. And that's when it's very interesting. But usually it's more brute force and intimidation. And, and most, most often it's energy manipulation. It's the TV turning on and off or the computer burning out or your car doesn't start. Those are the things that are most common because energy manipulation is the simplest thing any spirit can do because they themselves are energy. Mm -hmm. um, physical manipulation is much harder. I've, I've seen it. I, um, I've been in a bed that flew across the room three nights in a row just before I went on a bad case. Um, the gas turned on on my stove without the flame, filling up the house with gas overnight, three nights in a row. So um, that kind of thing can happen, and it can be very dangerous. Yep. Okay. Do you think your grandparents have come back in spirit form? Absolutely. I know they have many times, and they've helped. And they've been there for our uh, Christmas party. We had a virtual Christmas party online, and um, yep. all of a sudden I was very aware that they were there. Mm -hmm. And I, I looked to the medium I was sitting with, and she's like, yeah. Yeah, I just heard uh, your grandmother say, Christopher, we're here. Yep. And I'm like, yeah, well, she's the only one that calls me Christopher. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that party. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was, uh, that was pretty special. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what are your thoughts on our afterlife energy and extraterrestrial energy? Hmm. That's, a, that's an interesting combination. Um we certainly continue. Uh, I don't believe in hell. Uh, I don't believe in, you know, Dante's hell. I believe we create our own hell. 
that there are souls who are so black and so lost that they can't get close to the light of God and they, they hide in the darkness. And for them, that's hell. That's separation from God. But they do it to themselves. Um, I also believe, just as my grandparents did, I believe in uh, reincarnation. And I believe that we get the opportunity to keep coming back and evolving and learning. Uh, we're energy. And our body is only the car that we drive. It's the conveyance for our soul. And when that wears out, we, we leave it. But that's it. We don't die. Our body dies. Totally different thing. And we go back to where we came from. Hopefully a little closer to God this time. Mm -hmm. Um as for aliens, I absolutely believe, I absolutely overwhelming evidence that they exist and that they've been visiting the earth for thousands of years. Why haven't they made um, greater contact with us? I think they see us as an evolving species to be studied um, and that, if anything, they're probably worried about us. They, they in the 60s, um, there was an incident where we almost fired on the on the Soviet Union because of a flock of birds being mistaken for incoming uh, missiles. And a UFO appeared over several missile silos that were not the, the way the missile silos worked back then. I don't know today. Um, they're not in a sequence. They are individual. And he, this UFO appeared over each one and knocked them out so that they couldn't fire. Uh, we also shot a uh, rocket into space that had a space laser and uh, or some kind of space weapon anyway. And this UFO shows up and it's here. Here's the rocket. It's here. It shoots a beam of light. Then it's down here, shoots a beam of light. And it's over here, shoots a beam of light. And then the rocket explodes. And this has been reported by the government. That's the thing, you know, the governments of the world do report this stuff. Individuals report this stuff uh, more and more today. And in the last 20 years, it's extraordinary. Um, I, I, I think they're just waiting for us to evolve and hopefully I think they're probably concerned that what we'll do when we get out into the universe, because uh, right now we can't even get along with one another. What are we going to do when we're faced with something that we truly don't understand? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And then that brings up a question that I was thinking of real quick is, um, for the different teams that are out there, not everyone is trained in cleansing a home. Not everyone's trained with dealing with negative entities. And of course, not everyone's trained in dealing with actual demons. What do you suggest or any tips that you have for teams that feel they're kind of in over their head? Contact the Warren Legacy Foundation. We're happy to help. But, and this is important, we don't work with people who are not part of the foundation. Uh, it's a basic liability. If we don't know you, we don't know that you are um, capable of uh, helping a family. And we're not going to let that family be hurt. For us, the client always comes first. And, and, and that should be for any team. It should be. It should be. It should be. <laughs> Have you used loving words to rid lower energies out of the home? I've used compassion when I know I'm dealing with a human soul. Yes. Okay. Uh, there was a case um, of a suicide who was afraid because can you imagine uh, you get to a point where you just want to escape and you die, you kill yourself. And you're still there. You thought it was the end. And it's not an end. It's just a change. Mm -hmm. And for some, that's okay. You know, they pass over. They're fine. Others are stuck either because they're afraid they're going to go to hell because that's what they've been taught. Or because they see the grief 
that they've caused and they're overwhelmed by guilt. So you help them with compassion and love and you, you help them to pass over. We did that with a gentleman, um, an American gentleman here in Costa Rica. He had hung himself. I didn't know anything about the case when they brought me to the house, which is the way I work. If I'm, if I'm going there to be a psychic, uh, and I don't like to use my abilities, but on a case, if, if I'm going in there with that intention, then I cannot know anything about a case. I have to go in cold. Otherwise, you know, I, I can't trust what I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. And I could feel the choking and I could feel him right there. And he would move away from me. He didn't want to talk to me. He kept saying that, uh, you know, he was perfectly happy, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I could tell he was lying. But he did like this one woman who was with me, uh, another researcher. And he was following her. And we were able to work together and reassure him that he could pass over, that it was safe. He wasn't going to go to hell. And he, he did. He passed over. Mm -hmm. it's, it's always nice when you can help the spirits in addition to the living. Exactly. Oh, yeah. It was a great, it was a great night. It, it was a surprise. It wasn't, mm -hmm. I had not expected to be doing anything, to be quite honest. I went in not even knowing I was going on a case. So <laughs> it was something else. Okay. Um, so Shannon has a quick question. Her husband and um, she are both empaths. Um, he feels something negative in the house, but she doesn't. And she has become ill over the past few years with no explanations. Do you think using sage will remove any negative energy or is there something she needs to cite? Um, it isn't sage alone. Remember what I said, that only works for about two and a half hours, uh, two to three hours. So what you want to do is combine it with a ritual. And I, I described one earlier. Um, like contact us at help at warrenlegacy.com and we'll be happy to give you instructions on how to do that properly. If we have anybody close to you, um, then we will certainly do what we can to um, get you the help you need. Uh, you should also start using the white light to protect yourself morning and night. Uh, we have information on that. Um, for people who are psychic and empaths are definitely psychic, um, we have two different psychic support groups, one in English, one in Spanish, and uh, contact us and we'll be happy to hook you up with those as well. Um, the English one has about 750 members, I think, 600, mm -hmm. I can't recall. I'm not good at remembering the numbers, but hundreds, we have hundreds of people. Um, and they're, they're more than happy to help you as well. And we've got great resources online to help you, but it is only for psychics. And it's not for readings or anything of that sort. We make sure we keep it very positive because we don't want to overwhelm our members. Some of them are very, very sensitive. Empaths tend to uh, get overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Ian wants to know if you had any experiences that basically made you say you're not doing this anymore. <laughs> no. Um, I've had experiences that hurt a lot. Um, I've had two deaths. Okay. Um, but it doesn't make me want to stop. It just makes me want to be better. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and find new ways because, um, those are hard lessons. Mm -hmm. What is your concept of God? God, oh, I've got so many different ways of looking at God. But one way, God is like a weaver. And uh, we are just the threads. We can't see the tapestry that he's creating. So we have to have faith that we're moving in the right direction. And sometimes um i think of god as a blacksmith and we're just raw metal and he puts us in the fire and then he beats the hell out of us and sometimes you know we break and we have to be reforged again and again um but we're always a work in progress and god is always there to help and he's always there to guide but 
God's never going to take away your free will. Free will is, is a gift and he's not going to take it away from you. So you can do good or evil with it. And even evil, you know, again, it's a matter of perspective because when you look at something awful that's happened in the past, it hasn't had such amazingly good consequences later on. Yes, evil should be overcome, but that's sometimes the purpose of evil is to be overcome. We shouldn't accept it ever, but we should learn from it and, and try to fight it so that we become better. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then the second half of his question is, um, do you agree with the treaty of agreements of all religions to become one as proposed by Pope John Paul II? I'm unaware of that. Um, okay. But I think that all religions have some wisdom uh, that should be you, that should be understood and help us to learn and to live better. Uh, philosophy, music, science, art are all different ways of trying to understand God or express our understanding of God. Um, at the end of the day, the reality is all of the material world is made up of stuff that was formed in stars that exploded billions of years ago. We are star stuff. We are the universe aware of itself and looking back on itself and trying to understand itself, trying to understand God's creation. Mm -hmm. But when people ask, is the universe self-aware? Of course we are. We are the universe. A small speck of it, but we're still the universe. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. Why are things happening? Um, she wants to know, she thinks about it and then it happens. What's that? That's almost like self-manifesting. It could be. It could be precognition. Um, it could be intuition. Uh, you know, sometimes we're not aware of the cues we pick up around us. Um, for instance, uh, I knew there were problems with my parents' marriage before the divorce. Um, now, I don't think that was psychic. I think it was just me realizing things didn't seem right. And I subconsciously picked up on those cues and expressed them to my mother, even before she knew. Um, but there are certainly people who can have prophetic dreams uh, or visions. Edgar Casey is a good example. Um, but even with Edgar Casey, you know, when he, he, he could diagnose a person via the mail, uh, just with a photo, he could tell all sorts of things about a person, but his future telling the farther out in the future he got, the less accurate he had become. He had suggested that in the 1990s, most of uh, the eastern seaboard would be underwater. Now, that may still happen uh, with global warming. It, it seems pretty lovely, actually, but it has not happened yet. So he's not, he wasn't exact. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> oh, what protection rituals do you use before and after investigations? I use the Christ light. I protect myself with Christ light. Um, I also carry um, a couple of items that belong to my grandmother that help me to focus my faith. I feel closer to her. I ask Padre Pio for protection because he is the patron of my family. Uh, he has shown up on cases, both of my case cases and my uh, grandmother and grandfather's cases. Um, that's pretty much it. Uh, you know, I, I use rituals during cases as well, but those are different. Um, but for protection, basically, that's it. Okay. That, that was a question you already answered. Sorry, I'm trying to catch up here. Mm -hmm. and, oh, here's a quick comment from another one of our Warren Foundation members. Don't let ego get in the way of helping the client. Absolutely. Absolutely. When ego's in the room, there's not enough room for God. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, Kat uh, wants to know. Kat Maria was asking about uh, spirits who mimic the living. Yep. Doppelgangers is what they're called. Um, mm -hmm. Those interest me uh, because sometimes they're completely innocent. Um, now, my grandfather had a tendency to see demons almost everywhere. And he would say that was diabolical confusion. I don't agree. Uh, sometimes, yes, absolutely sometimes. But not, not all the time. Uh, sometimes I don't know what it is. Um, I used to hear my name called uh, when one friend that I really loved and cared about was in trouble. And this was when my abilities were just really blossoming. Uh, when I was 19, 18, and uh, I, I would hear her calling my name when she was in trouble. But uh, others, you know, even last week, I had a, a, a woman report that she, she, you know, her daughter walked by and then it turned out her daughter wasn't even in the house at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that actually happens a lot. We, he we hear about that a lot. And I, I wish I could give you a, a definite answer. It depends on what other phenomena is going on in the house. If there's poltergeist phenomena going on, if people are, you know, having things thrown at them uh, or they're being hurt, then, yeah, absolutely. We're looking at something that's diabolical uh, or possibly diabolical. Um, sometimes it is a human spirit that's really pissed off and they can do amazing things. Mm -hmm. And then I just want to go back to our ethics real quick that we have. Um, one of the lines is when we agree to take on a case, it is our responsibility until we turn it over to another professional or close it. Absolutely. What steps should all paranormal teams take in an investigation to make sure they help the client the best as possible? If, if you don't think that you're capable of handling that case, then find somebody else who can. Don't just run away from it. That's something that frustrates me so much you know there is help available don't just say oh my god well this horrible thing happened so we're not coming back then what the hell are you doing in this work if you can be intimidated that easily by evps or by something flying across the room then you shouldn't be there at all you know um And honestly, if you're going to get into this work, then get involved with a reputable group that already exists. Don't start off all by yourself. Uh, that's one of our rules. You never go on a case alone, ever, uh, for so many different reasons. But number one, if you get hurt, then what happens to the family? Uh, number two, sometimes you're dealing with people who have a lot of emotional problems. And what if they accuse you of something? You know, where's your proof that you didn't do it? You know, uh, liability is a real issue in this world. And you need to protect yourself and you need to protect the family. So don't do it alone. And if you really have something to offer, if you truly believe that this is a calling for you, then contact us. We're always looking for good people. It doesn't cost anything to join. Um, we are just looking for people who are truly dedicated to the client. Yeah. Okay. How do you deal with psychologists and other medical professionals who don't believe in the paranormal? My job isn't to convince them. My job is to help the family. And sometimes, yeah. I, we have a medical, uh, we have a doctor who is our, um, our advisor, medical advisor. She gave excellent advice. When you tell a client to go to their doctor to get checked out and they, th for instance, they say, uh, you know, a ghost is pulling my leg at night. Well, don't tell the doctor that. S tell the doctor, I feel a pulling sensation on my leg at night. Describe the symptom. 
don't you tell them what you think the cause is because that could just be your fear um now with psychologists it's a whole nother thing altogether um then you want to talk to somebody who is more open to that idea uh, and you'd be surprised how many are uh, we've got two psychologists we work with and they're excellent um i'm a therapist i i believe in the paranormal <laughs> Um, now having said that, I don't take on, uh, therapy clients. I, I'm not going to take you on as a patient. Um, I don't think it's right. Uh, I can't give you that, that much time because there are too many cases to work on. Um, but I, I can guide you and help you to find the right person. Okay. And then Emma also asked, going back to Sage, how does Sage actually work? Um, she understands that it does. But like, what are the mechanics behind it? It actually um, ionically charges the air and lifts the, it literally lifts energy. Um, there, there are papers online, you, you can Google on um, how smudging works. And there's some good scientific papers on that. And uh, that's why I know, for instance, it only works for two to three hours. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> say white sage has been used for hundreds if not thousands of years and uh so so uh, fr uh frankincense and myrrh uh, mm -hmm. we know that these things work uh, you know we may not always i may not always agree with the reasons uh the ancients believed something worked uh but that doesn't mean that they didn't have wisdom and things to learn from uh mm -hmm. You know, they, they used to believe a lot of things that we don't about mental illness and demonic uh, possession being the cause of all of that. Um, no, you know, our brains also are pretty amazing things and we can get ill, mentally ill. And we, should, we shouldn't have a stigma about that because the, the reality is, you know, a ridiculous number of us are going to go through depression at some point in our life. Mental illness is a reality, and we shouldn't be stigmatizing these people. I've suffered from depression several times in my life. I, you know, I thank God now uh, for all the things I've been through. Um, it's given me the perspective and the empathy to help others. Um, but at the time going through it, it was help. Absolutely. But get the help you need, including the medication. And if you're on antidepressants, don't go off them without talking to your doctor because cold turkey can really screw up your brain chemistry. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about empaths who also have psychic abilities and can speak telepathically to spirits? Now, an empath is a low level psychic. All right. Um, but here's the thing. I don't like labels. Um, labels limit you. Uh, they want to put labels, want to put everything in a box. This is what you are. And I think we're, we can be so much more than our labels. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm many, many different things. I'm not just one thing, you know? Um, so why not? Absolutely. Just because you can pick up on the energies of others doesn't mean you also don't have clairvoyant gifts or telepathic gifts or telekinetic gifts. Um, why limit yourself? When people ask, what are my abilities? Well, I'm willing to try just about anything to see what happens. I've smelled things. I've heard things. I've seen things. I've uh, been, I've had you know, experiences uh, communicating with spirits through me, uh, channeling. Uh, I've done psychometry. You know, why limit myself with labels? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I, I mean, that's one of the problems that I felt with me is I always labeled myself as an empath. And that's kind of like where I kept myself for so many years. So. Yeah, don't. You know, it's self-defeating. Um, when It's the same thing with um, the self-fulfilling prophecy. 
if you believe something great about yourself, you can manifest that and make it real. Um, if others believe it, they can manifest it in you and make it real. Uh, there have been tons of psychological studies where they've done bogus uh, uh, aptitude tests on a classroom. And then they'll say, this half of the class, they'll tell the teacher, this half of the class is just going to be normal this year. But this half of the class, this half's going to excel. And at the end of the year, lo and behold, the half that the teacher was told would excel did. That's mm -hmm. because the teacher believed it would happen and they made it happen. Yep. We have that ability. We can't stop the earth from spinning around the sun, but we can affect our local reality. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And the next question we've actually talked quite a bit about is, do you find entities are sometimes specific to one's background and culture? Absolutely. Yeah, of course. We manifest them that way. Um, it, it's that idea that that formless fear is then shaped by our cultural and spiritual beliefs. And if, if you have those beliefs, if you truly believe in a, a dryad or a duende or whatever, then those things will manifest as that. But that's you making it manifest that way. Uh, Tibetan monks can create tulpas, um, which is a thought manifestation. Um, there, there's a great story of a, a, an old monk. The young monks in the monastery were making too much noise, so he manifested a tiger in the hallway to terrify them. And it would growl. You could smell it. I got to help you. You probably could touch it. Um, and it was just there to terrify them, to shut up, and then it disappeared. Mm -hmm. It's amazing what the mind can do. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's always a learning process, too, to learn more and more what can be done. You know, I tell people, um, and this is not paranormal at all, but never say I can't. Say I won't. It changes everything. Mm -hmm. I can't is powerlessness. I won't is a decision. I won't say I can't fly because I have flown twice. And if, if that's possible without my choosing to fly, then maybe it's also possible for me to do it when I choose. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to jump off a building. Uh, <laughs> But having said that, it, it's important to not say I can't. I can't is self-defeating. I mm -hmm. won't have a choice. Yeah. Okay. And Kat wants to know, what are your take on claims of spirits mimicking the living? For example, they had a guy hearing and seeing his wife walking. Turned out she was on the other side of the home sound asleep. That's what we were just talking about a few minutes ago, yep. the doppelgangers. Yep. Yeah. That's actually why I brought it up because I saw Okay. Her. <laughs> Good question. Okay. And what are your thoughts about a halo over a reading? I, I don't understand that question. Okay. Gordon, if you can reiterate that and maybe restate it with a little bit more explanation, we can answer that before we're done. We still have 30 minutes, so you got plenty of time. Okay. And do you think the keys are respect, knowledge, and faith? What more? Not sure on that one either. Compassion. I should have read that before I put it up. Passion. Compassion. Empathy. Uh, but professionalism. Never get so involved with your client that you are not really able to help them. Sometimes your emotions can get so involved that instead of helping them, all you're doing is enabling them. Um, so you have to be more professional and treat it more like a patient-doctor relationship. Okay. And Gordon finally commented back. He says, what he meant was, do you see a halo appear around one's head that you're interviewing? When I was younger, I used to read words, but I also used to terrify people because I knew things I shouldn't know. And it really turned me off to reading words. 
So I don't do that anymore. And I have not done it in decades. Um, I don't do readings ever. The best you'll get from me is I'll hold your hand and I'll feel your energy to see if I'm getting something good or bad, if there's an attachment on you. That I don't mind doing. But anything more is, in my opinion, an invasion of privacy, and I won't do it. Mm -hmm. So I don't see halos around people around people because I don't look. Mm -hmm. I'm lucky. I'm not one of those uh, people who are always turned on psychically, who mm -hmm. who always walk into a room and say, like, "Ooh, what's going on?" No, I have to actually turn it on for it to affect me. And it does. You know, Friday I walked into that one house and I was like, boom. It, it literally knocked me back. I did not expect that. Um, but the energy was overwhelming. But I had already opened myself up to the idea that I wanted to sense it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Lewis wants to know if you ever see past the veil or seeing flashes of light without thunder or colored orbs. No. Okay. No. Uh, you know the thing about orbs? Uh, they're such a popular thing nowadays. In my day, we actually had full manifestations of spirits. Um, orbs, again, are more often than not digital fragments. They're almost never anything else. That doesn't mean they aren't. There are occasions where I've seen some amazing stuff. Um, we, we have a wonderful, uh, researcher up in Washington state, Stephanie Treadway, and, um, she's got a wonderful video, uh, where she was in, uh, I think it was Deadwood and a manifestation was right there on, on video of these, these white things appearing, but, uh, they're few and far between. Mm -hmm. Okay, and do psychics like me attract all types of human, animal, and demons? I don't know. I, I don't know you. Uh, <laughs> um, you again, my grandmother would tell you you attract the thing, the energy you put out into the universe. Positive energy attracts positive entities. Negative energy attracts negative energy uh, entities. Is that because you're self manifesting? Maybe. I, psychics are really capable of that very strongly uh, but ghosts ghosts are just attracted to you because your aura burns more brightly than a normal person's okay. or a less gifted person you're still normal <laughs> um can animals be ghosts yes yep my dog brandy uh haunted me for 20 years until i got a new dog Every time I was sick, he would come visit. He'd hit my hand uh, with his nose, just like he used to do. Uh, he'd jump up on the bed, circle around to get comfortable, and lay down next to me. Uh, yeah, absolutely, dogs and cats. My, my cat, Tom, for about a day or two after she died, I kept seeing her walking in the house. Mm -hmm. Cats being cats, you know, she didn't stick around. <laughs> Yeah, I know when we go visit my parents, they have a staircase and they used to have a Pomeranian. And you would hear when he would go down the stairs, his collar go clink, 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 clink. And he died many years ago. And every time I'm there, when I'm sitting in the living room at night, you can hear the clink, clink, clink coming mm -hmm. down the stairs. It's it's really neat. Yeah, I love that. You know, mm -hmm. if, they, if they're there to protect you, they're there to protect you. Yep. Okay. So basically, Lewis was saying that he tends to see orbs of colors flashing in front of his eyes um, from time to time. What do you think that means? Is it around people? Uh, or first, you know, obviously you want to check to make sure you're not having a, and I'm not saying this as a joke. I need to make that clear. You need to check to make sure you're not having a stroke or some other um, cerebral incident. Uh, you want to check that out. Um, Optometrist, optometrist might be a good choice as well. Now, if you've got other psychic experiences, that's a different thing. Then we can look at that. Um, but this is the kind of thing we have an actual conversation about. Asking me a couple of quick questions like this. 
it's just you know it, you're you're asking for a diagnosis without giving full information and i don't want to lead you astray that's one of the the problems i've i've found with people in this field um they go in they get a first impression they share with the family and then the family jumps on that and that becomes the reality for them and we never say something is demonic ever to a family until we have no choice whatsoever um because that fear can manifest mm -hmm. yeah. we always minimize the fear first mm -hmm. yeah yeah i actually getting back to that i had to play cleanup after an event and i shared this with you we did um before i left vegas we did one last event at a location that i always love doing fundraisers for there's a lot of residual energy there but there's only one spirit who's there because he's protective of his clothing that was donated to the museum Right, and we've right, interacted right. with him tons of times. And so we did this open event. And the next day I get a call from the mine manager because it was a mine museum. And she was like, just so you know, I'm not letting it bother me. But I was told by three people who came to the event that there is a demon here. And there's a spirit of a child molester who's here to attack the children when they come on school tours. Yeah. And I was like, oh, OK. And she's like, I know it's not because she she jumps in on the investigations with us. She loves it. <laughs> and she'll even walk in every day and say, hi, Donald, how are you today? Because that's the spirit that's in the museum. And, you know, mm -hmm. she's very nice and loves it. But it was just if, if she wasn't already open to it and knew it wasn't threatening, the cleanup we would have had to have done with that. Was, and you know, that, that brings me up to that, that one thing I tell everybody in almost every uh, interview, which is never trust a psychic. Uh, I'm a psychic, you're a psychic, you know, half the audience are psychics, but we're not foolproof. Mm -hmm. We're not 100% right. And when we start thinking we are, then we're probably more wrong than you know. Um, and calling yourself a psychic, and if people believe that, your words carry weight. Mm -hmm. So you be very careful what you share. Mm -hmm. If I share, I share as a question not as an answer um you know like for instance um i f i feel an awful lot of sadness in in the kitchen is that where you go when when you're really sad is that where you go to cry yeah yeah but i'm, I'm not going to say oh i feel this this overwhelming heavy energy in the in the kitchen um, I think there's something horrifying there. No, it's a woman who's just been, her husband just left and she goes in the kitchen to hide from the, her kids and cries. That's all. Right. I, I mean, even if you pick up on that and that's what they picked up on, you, you don't tell the client until you have proof. <laughs> is, exactly. Is my theory. Proof is the, <laughs> you're right. Proof is the thing. <laughs> It, I don't believe anything I feel until I've got evidence to back it yeah. up. You know, I, I just, I don't have enough faith in myself. Mm -hmm. Right. And then I don't, I can't remember. We've had so many talks recently. I don't know if it was you I talked to about this or someone else, but the concept of psychics um, and people getting so quick to judge them and get upset with them if they're wrong. But the concept is similar to the weatherman. Yeah. They're, they're predicting so far out, but no one gets mad at him if it rains and he said it was going to be sunny. <laughs> oh, people get mad at the weatherman all the time. But the truth <laughs> is, you know, the best psychic in the world is only right 70% of the time. And most mm -hmm. of us are definitely not the best. Right. You know, if you can pick up on, you know, 30% of a person that you've never met and you're, you're picking up on, you know, the their family who died mm -hmm. and you're, you're accurately describing some of the things about that person. Yeah, sure. You, you'll get a lot wrong, but still that's pretty impressive that you're picking up on, you know, grandpa who had the old Cadillac and it was always breaking down. If that's all you got and that's all that was right, I'm still impressed. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So what are your thoughts on skinwalkers? 
You see, now that's another one that's uh, this similar to um, similar to the, the Duendes and the Lamona. No, La, Lamona or um, several other creatures that are supposedly uh, evil witches. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't know whether it's a psychic manifestation. Um, that's what I think it is. Uh, or if it's just a superstition. Um, but I, I definitely don't believe that a human being can physically change their body structure so much that they turn into an, a separate kind of creature like a werewolf. Mm -hmm. um, you can take on animalistic uh, characteristics. I believe that. But to physically alter, no. You, you can even, in photos, look like a different person. A psychic projection overlaid on your on your face. I've seen that plenty of times. Uh, but that that's about it. That's about all I can imagine it is. Okay. Have you ever suffered anything at your grandparents' house because of their museum? No. Uh, well, terror. Uh, when I was three or four years old, my my younger sister locked me in the museum at night. Scared the crap out of me. But uh, other than that, other than that, oh, there was one thing that had happened. I had gone there um, with my lady, and we had taken a whole bunch of photos. Uh, she wanted photos with Annabelle at my grandfather's desk, all sorts of stuff. And we had also taken photos before and after, you know. And the next morning, we're looking at all of these photos, and all of the photos before the museum and all of the photos after the museum, they're there. But every single photo that was taken in the museum was gone, just gone. Other than that, um, I've had plenty of experiences with my grandparents haunting the house after because I lived with my grandparent or grandmother as she was dying for the last uh, year and a half or so. And I was with her when she died and um, she did manifest. And my grandfather used to manifest as well um, and at the house. I used to hear them walking, uh, talking, uh, all sorts of stuff. Okay. And in all of your years in the paranormal that. world, <laughs> has there ever been a time when you came across something you didn't know about and it made you run out of reactions at the time? Run out of reactions? Uh, I've been speechless a number of times. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and I run into things I don't know all the time. Uh, even when I think I know it, I, I, I can't be a hundred percent certain because mm -hmm. we're dealing with things that are beyond us. Um, for instance, for instance, uh, my fiance died of cancer and she came to visit me twice. And the second time I was in our bedroom and I, I heard footsteps coming down the hallway. And she was a heavy woman. I, I knew her footsteps. And I opened my eyes and I was in bed and I'm looking at the, the mirror on the back of the bedroom door. Now it was pitch black. I should not have been able to see anything. And yet I could see her in the mirror behind me in bed propped up on one elbow, looking down on at me with a smile on her face. And I closed my eyes because I, I just didn't want to see her disappear again. And I, I didn't want to lose her again. And she got right in front of my face and she said, I love you. And she kissed me on the lips and she was gone. Now, I believed for years that that was another, my second visitation with her last one that ever happened she had unfinished business she needed to say that to me um and she did and she passed over having said that was it uh is it possible it was a self-manifestation of my grief and something that i needed and so i manifested it i don't think so but it is in the realm of possibility so even when I think I know something, I'm still willing to question it. 
all that matters at the end of the day, and this is this goes back to our, our talk about ethics. All that matters at the end of the day is not whether we have the answer. It's could we help the family? That's all that matters. And what are your thoughts about St. Benito's medal as a sacramental for protection? You know, the, the, the amazing thing about that particular uh, St. Saint, Saint Benedict's son, Benito, um, on the back of that is an ancient uh, exorcism symbol. And because literally millions and millions and millions of people, well over a billion actually, have believed in this symbol and have put their faith in this symbol, it has extraordinary power. Absolutely does. But if you don't believe in it, it's just a piece of metal. Mm -hmm. You have to believe too. Okay, and that goes to the next question. Protective objects against spirits and demons, do they really work? If you believe in them, they do. The object itself is only a conduit for your faith in God. That's all it is. Um, <laughs> uh, love at first bite, an old movie. Uh, George Hamilton plays Dracula. And the guy who plays... Uh, I don't know, Harkness or whatever, um, pulls out a crucifix and he holds it up. And Dracula's like, that's not going to work. You're Jewish. You know, if you don't believe in it, it's a, it's nothing. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. And, and that's why I always tell clients is to make sure that you believe in what's happening in your home as far as protecting yourself. And that goes mm -hmm. with doing the um, cleansings based on the family's religion and their personal beliefs. Absolutely. And, you know, people will often want to argue with me about my grandparents and say, well, they're Catholic. Yeah, they're Catholic, but they worked with every religion in the world. They worked with the religion of the family. Mm -hmm. We worked with Buddhist monks and rabbis and everybody else you can imagine. Imams, uh, Muslim imams, because you work with the family's faith. Sometimes the only faith they have is in you. And then you better not screw it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's I've had clients where other people have tried like everything possible in in their religion, and it wasn't working. And I suggest you know, hey, let's try something else. And they're like, I believe in you, <laughs> so I believe whatever you're doing will work. And that sometimes Absolutely. is just enough too. Absolutely, and and you know that gets into um, self manifestation, placebo effect. Uh, and faith and basic faith, you know, it, it doesn't matter at the end of the day why it worked as long as it works. Right. Okay. Has anything ever stopped you from finishing helping a family? Yeah, the family. <laughs> yeah. Um, when the problem often is that they want you to go in and wave a magic wand and everything mysterious and magically ends. But the truth is, it's your battle. We're there to help. We're there to guide. We're there to fight with you. But if you're not willing to work on the things that make you vulnerable, your alcoholism, your drug abuse, your domestic violence, your bad relationship relationships, your anger and guilt, whatever it is, if you're not working on that, then we can do all the house cleansing in the world. And it's not going to be enough because that negativity is still going to bring it back in. I tell people the very first thing you do is you clean your house. Get rid of all the, the crap, all the clutter that you've got in your home. And then start playing happy, light music. Uh, watch comedies that literally make you laugh out loud. Show love to one another. Make love. Take fights outside and resolve them before you come back inside if you can. Get rid of the resentment. Learn to say, I forgive you. And you'll find when you start raising the energy of the home, then that negative entity has far less to feed off of and cannot manifest. It'll fight. It'll try to get you to be afraid. It'll try to get you to feed it more. But... Keep feeding it light. 
and you will you will lessen its its ability to hurt. And then we can work much more easily on helping you with what we do. But those are the steps you take. And do you think just like evil things? must be? Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Just like evil must be invited in, so must good. You have mm -hmm. to invite it in. Prayer is important. Okay, do you think God sends his angels to earth in human form? I think my grandmother might have been one. Um, I think that there are people who choose to come back to help others. The Dalai Lama, for instance. Um, he's the 14th in the line of Dalai Lamas, and every one of them is a reincarnation of the last. I've met the man. I spent a weekend with him. One of the holiest people I've ever met in my life. Literally glowed. You want to talk about glowing? There you go, right there. Mm -hmm. um, he chooses to come back and help. So I do believe that that's possible. Uh, but actual angels? Probably not. No, I, I, I don't. I don't think so. I don't think inhuman spirits like that would manifest in a human form i don't think it's going anyway i i don't know i've never i've never seen any evidence to indicate they have and then michelle says her nephew wants to know why do spirits are they why are they able to levitate objects so easily not easily that's really hard um physical manipulation of uh, the environment is very difficult. Uh, ener energetic manipulation, like turning the radio on and off, the TV on and off, that's much easier. Um, but throwing a vase across the room, that's harder. Mm -hmm. And often uh, it's, it's going to be a, a, hu a living human doing that uh, telekinetically. Um, you know, it's the teenager who's going through an awful lot of new emotions and they're all stirred up and there's a lot of conflict in the family and their their own frustration and anger manifests as poltergeist phenomena. Not always. Sometimes it actually is a spirit. Um, but sometimes it's a human, mm -hmm. a living human. Right. Okay. And then Stephanie wants to know if you've ever had a case where you couldn't help the client. Yes. Yeah, when the, when the client won't help themselves. Absolutely. And there are other times. Uh, we're, we're not 100%. You know, no, nobody is. But we do our best. And, you know, then if we can't, we do everything we can to get them somebody who can. Okay. And then this looks like it's our last question. I finally caught up to the end. <laughs> when faced with the spirit of an evil spirit, do you feel the desire to take a stand against them? Oh yeah, every every single time. But I'm also very careful that I know it's not me. Uh, I don't go in acting like a superhero. I go in there merely to ask God to do the work. I'm not doing the work. All 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 of the credit goes to God when it goes right, and all of the blame comes to me when it goes wrong. <laughs> okay. And since that's it for the questions, we have a few minutes left. Is there anything about ethics or paranormal investigator responsibilities that you want to mention that we didn't touch on? Well, we've been doing this for two hours, and I'm sure there are a lot of people who are, were not here at the beginning. So I guess the first thing I want to reiterate is, um, please, this isn't a hobby. Just like surgery shouldn't be a hobby. You don't watch ER and say, ooh, that looks like fun. Let me try you know, it it's something that should be taken very seriously. You're dealing with real people's lives, and it, it can have long-lasting repercussions. Um, please, please, if if you're if you get in over your head, have the humility and the the empathy to ask for help, and that's what we're here for. We're here to help. It's not me alone, because if it was, it wouldn't be adequate. That's why the foundation exists. That's why we're such a, a strong organization, because we've got so many good people with so many different backgrounds who can offer so many different 
insights. Um, because I don't know a lot about magic, for instance. And we've got many different people from different magical backgrounds. Magic, in my opinion, is energy manipulation through ritual. And it focuses your intention into something tangible. Um, it's quantum physics at work, and we just don't understand it yet. Um, that's what I believe. Uh, Heather, you want to give a rebuttal on that? <laughs> no, there, there's a lot that, you know, it goes along with the um, thermo theories of the thermodynamics where energy cannot be created nor destroyed, and that's how things move on. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of research that I've been doing that I still, I haven't even scratched the surface of it. And I mean, most of the magic I do, I guess you would call me a kitchen witch is what people say a lot. <laughs> but mm -hmm. um, it, it's all about putting your focus into something, your belief into something, and that's what manifests what's ha what happens and everything Absolutely. like that. So, Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, it, and it's not foolproof. I mean, I'm pretty sure, I, I know for a fact that a whole lot of witches cursed uh, the former president, and mm -hmm. that didn't seem to have stopped him. Um, <laughs> so it has its limitations. Mm -hmm. If you don't believe that it's going to work, then it, it probably isn't going to work mm -hmm. on you. Um, th there, there's a huge amount of faith on the part of the, the receiver of the problem as well. Or blessing. Blessing or... Mm -hmm. or right. Not. But having said that, that brings me back to that uh, study I, I sort of mentioned, where they had taken uh, 10,000 heart patients and what they had done uh, and they didn't tell the doctors, they didn't tell the patients. So this was a completely blind study. Um, no, nobody knew they were part of this. There was no placebo effect involved, but they took half of these heart patients and they put them on as many prayer lists as they could. And the other half, they didn't do that. with. And for those that were on prayer lists, they had a higher survival rate and they got better much more quickly than those who were not on the prayer lists. So regardless of whether or not um, you believe or know, it can still have a, a strong effect. Energy can be manipulated through our minds. And yeah. I, we know that from quantum physics as well. I mean, the, the, uh, the, ob the observer changes the outcome. Yep. Yeah, that's a, that's a big principle. Um, Heinsberg's principle or... Yeah, Heisenberg. I, I yeah, and, 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 and Schrodinger, Schrodinger's cat. The yeah. idea that the cat is both alive and dead until you look at it. Right. Yep. yep. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. But um, for those of you that still have more questions, don't worry. A huge announcement starting next week, The Warren Files on October 6th. We will be airing Opposite Nights of Ghost Education 101 at 9 p.m. Eastern. It'll be on the Warren Legacy Foundation for Paranormal Research's Facebook page. There's the address right there. And we will also be posting on Pun TV, which is where Ghost Education 101 airs. So next week, Chris will be joining me again. So you'll have two more hours with us talking about, we're actually going to talk about the foundation, um, how it was created, our goals, and then we might touch on the ethics. But then again, as always, we will be there to answer your questions. Next, um, Ghost Education 101, Kenneth Holden, um, who is a regional director with the Warren Foundation. I see a pattern here. No. <laughs> Will be joining say, me. Well, this is not good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had the other Kenneth on, Kenneth Torres, a couple weeks ago or a couple months ago. Oh, so, good. and it, it, it's, just, we're, I'm just going through the foundation. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but he reached out to me and he wants to talk about spirits and psychic abilities um, for our followers. And for those awesome. of you who are not already following us, you can follow us at Ghost Education 101. Um, I will put all of our information for the Warren Legacy Foundation on the Ghost Education 101 page, so that way you guys can find the foundation on Facebook, the website, and know which emails to reach out to for help. Or if you want more information on joining us, um, we will put that on the page as well. Mm -hmm. So again, thank you, Chris, for joining us. It was so good to have you on here. <laughs> And Thank I will be taking notes from us. this for the book. <laughs> so I, I thank you, Heather. You, it's I, you know I really feel blessed to have you in my life. 
Thank you very oh, much for this. Yeah. And thank, thank you, you everyone for joining us on this uh, two hour journey. Yes, thank you everyone. And we will, I'm getting to my outro, hold on. <laughs> and um, so again, thank you. And we will see you guys in two weeks and next week with Warren Files. Have a great night. God bless you.